Hello, everyone, and happy Douglas Week. So great to see you all here. Thank you for joining us for this third Douglas Week, the third annual Douglas Week. And uh, we're excited to share this uh, unique event here today with our repeat contributor to Douglas Week, John Muller. But first of all, my name is Dr. Caroline Dunham Schroeder. I'm the founder of Douglas Week. I'm really happy to be here with you all online as well as in Rochester in person this year um, because that's uh, where uh, Fred Douglas lived for 25 years. And we have lots of different events here. We have hybrid, we have online, we have in-person events. So lots to check out. Go to our, our website, douglasweek.org. And you'll if you like this event, you'll like all the other events too. Um, so yeah, we are here with John Muller. Um, we're excited that he is here and able to join us. And uh, just a little bit about um, John Muller before he uh, talks to us about the lost history of Frederick Douglass and the University of Rochester. So John Muller is uh, the author of Frederick Douglass in Washington DC, The Lion of Anacostia, which was published in 2012. And the book called Mark Twain in Washington DC, The Adventures of a Capital Correspondent, published in 2013. Um, John, as we know and absolutely appreciate, has presented widely throughout the D.C. Baltimore metropolitan area at venues including the Library of Congress, Krant Library, D.C. Public Library, the uh, Frederick Douglass National Historic Site, and local universities. And uh, we're very excited about this. Um, um, John has led a variety of walking tours, Frederick Douglass walking tours in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Harpers Ferry, and other areas. So if you are in any of those places, go check it out, get in touch with John and join one of his, his tours. And yeah, I mean, uh, just before I hand over, um, you know, like I said, this is uh, we have more than 40 events for Douglas Week. Go check it out. Uh, look at our website, follow us on social media and learn more about what we do with Douglas Week. And now, John, thank you for being here. Uh, excited for this talk and over to you, John. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Douglas Week as a return presenter. Let me just get this uh, up. Can you guys, can you guys see the screen? Perfect, John. Thank you. All right. Um, welcome everybody who's tuning in online. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, this is uh, an abbreviated presentation. This uh, presentation could be um, several parts, several hours, several chapters, but we are just going to take a couple minutes to briefly discuss the lost history of Mr. Frederick Douglass and the University of Rochester. Now, just a couple overall notes is that um, Frederick Douglass in higher education is a really, really understudied topic in the field of Douglassonian studies. Uh, Frederick Douglass served on the board of Howard University from 1872 to his death in 1895. Um, but he also served on the board of other universities. Um, he spoke at several universities. Um, he knew university presidents. He knew university founders. Um, he knew faculty. Uh, um, he knew students. It just Douglas and higher education is just. Um, I really think uh, it's it's unfortunately been ignored um, in the field of Douglasonian studies, and I think to the great detriment because we have. Higher education studies Frederick Douglass, but doesn't study Frederick Douglass in higher education. Um, and that's too bad. And so moving forward, maybe we can improve upon that and bring a greater awareness and recognition of Douglass in higher education. And Douglass in higher education, um, University of Rochester is pretty important to Douglass's lifelong relationship with higher education. Now, Douglass, you know, never attended uh, classroom in his life or never attended university, he was frequently asked, Mr. Douglas, you're so knowledgeable and articulate and, you know, rational in your philosophy. You, you, you're highly educated. Where did you receive your degree? So Frederick Douglas, or the, where did you go to college? So Mr. Douglas would say that he was a graduate of Massachusetts Abolition University, President William Lloyd Garrison is obviously a joke where Frederick Douglass um, was, uh, <laughs> I think that's pretty insightful that Douglass was asked that many times and kind of would joke basically saying that he had 
a more modern context is people will say that they graduated from OCU University, which people in the community will say that means on the corner university or on the community university. And so it's kind of saying like the school of hard knocks or someone who was self-taught. So nonetheless, whereas Frederick Douglass was largely in many ways self-taught or he was the director of his own uh, education, Douglass was recognized throughout his life by universities receiving honorary degrees from Howard, honorary degrees from Wilberforce University, um, speaking at Tuskegee, speaking at Fisk, um, speaking at Bates College, Hillsdale College, University of Michigan. Um, all, of, uh, all of this context, we must, uh, I'll try to bring this back home to University of Rochester. So, so University of Rochester was founded in 1850. By the gentleman who you'll see there with the uh, the gentleman in the middle with the beard, that is Martin Brewer Anderson. Okay, he was the founding president of the University of Rochester. He served from 1850 till I believe 1890. Someone maybe can fact check uh, me there. But he, he served for several decades um, as the founding president. I'm not horribly familiar with with Rochester's history of integrated education and or co-ed education. Before the Civil War, there were very few universities uh, that admitted both men and women and admitted um, black folks and white folks. Bowdoin College in Maine uh, being one of them, Oberlin in Ohio being another. Uh, so that being said, Martin Brewer Anderson, by my um, interpretation, was a pretty radical progressive fellow and i do not know if he was a free will baptist where the free will baptists were radical in their orientation towards slavery where they were um kind of more abolitionist minded and for those of you who know your douglas history you'll know that frederick douglas served on the board of store college in harper's ferry which was founded by free will Baptists from New England, mostly uh, Maine. Um, so I do not know if Mr. Martin Brewer Anderson was of the free will Baptist denomination, but he was of the Baptist denomination in which he had a, he did not have biases or prejudice or discrimination, whereas he befriended Mr. Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass in 1854 is invited to speak at Case Western Reserve University or Ohio, uh, Western Reserve University in, uh, it was back then it was in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. So in 1854, Frederick Douglass is invited to give this uh, commencement address. Um, Professor John Blassingame, who was mentioned a day or two ago in the context of the Frederick Douglass papers, According to the late Dr. Blassingame, in 1854, Frederick Douglass is the first Black American to give a commencement address at what is known as a PWI, or predominantly white institution. So when Douglass was invited to give this address or this speech, the issue in which he spoke about was phrenology. Phrenology was a, I guess you could say, a pseudoscience uh, that was popular in the mid 19th century. And one of its uh, arguments was essentially saying that there was, uh, I guess, biological differences between white folks and black folks. And that this then had an, had an impact on uh, intellectual capacities of the respective uh, black folks, white folks. Well, Frederick Douglass uh, disagreed with this and uh, frequently um, I would say, I guess people who endorsed a racist ideology would, would try to use phrenology as a way to justify some of their arguments. So therefore, Douglas, addressing this very timely issue, essentially refuted uh, phrenology and said that this is actually kind of a um, pseudoscience or witch science, and this is not based in you know evidence. And... Um, when Douglas is preparing to give this speech, for those of you who are familiar with your Douglas, will know that Douglas talks about in his Life and Times uh, autobiographical writing of how he did not have in his personal library 
the resources that he felt were sufficient to study this issue. So who did he turn to? He turned to his friend, Martin Brewer Anderson, President Anderson, the president of the University of Rochester. The president of the University of Rochester lent out of his own personal library, possibly even maybe the university's fledgling library, he loaned books to Frederick Douglass to prepare and study for this speech that he was deliver to deliver at Case Western Reserve University. Also a gentleman named Francis Wayland, who I won't get into, but he has connections to Brown University. Uh, one of his sons was the dean of Yale Law School. These gentlemen also helped Mr. Douglas prepare for this address that he delivered in 1854. So Frederick Douglass delivers this address in 1854. Uh, there are editorials and newspapers across the country um, essentially uh, applauding and commending Mr. Douglas for this address and essentially saying that if Frederick Douglass as, you know, a black American or I guess the, the terminology of the day would be, you know, Negro leader, that if Frederick Douglass uh, is capable of addressing a university and making these arguments, essentially it undermines our intellectual argument to to keep black folks enslaved. Um, I, I don't have all of these citations. I'm kind of speaking uh, off the cuff, if you will, but but this is um, this was a pretty big deal in its day of Frederick Douglass delivering a commencement at a white university in 1854. And obviously, in Douglass's invitation to speak at the university was due to the students. And if you visit the university today, they have a banner outside the uh, university library proclaiming and celebrating Frederick Douglass's address there in 1854. I do not believe the University of Rochester has done anything to recognize the fact that the first president of the university was friends with Douglass and lent him these books to prepare for this 1854 address. There are correspondence between Mr. Douglas and President Anderson. For example, in 1868, Frederick Douglass is invited to speak at Lewisburg University, which is today known as Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. So Frederick Douglass writes to Mr. Anderson and says that I'm frequently invited to speak uh, at locations I've never visited before. Sometimes I get there and they're really not prepared to receive me. I'm writing to inquiry of you if you are familiar with the university and its, its administration. And do you think that um, it would be a good place to deliver university? The fact that Frederick Douglass writes to President Anderson and asks for his counsel and advice demonstrates the closeness of their relationship, the dynamics of their relationship, and the fact that Frederick Douglass trusted Mr. Anderson, which I think is very critical and important. Furthermore, Frederick Douglass knew many of the, of the students at University of Rochester. I'm not as studied on Douglass and the University of Rochester as I am on Douglass and Howard University, for example. Whereas Frederick Douglass was a frequent presence on campus at Howard, and would frequently almost sit in on classes as though he was auditing classes. He would attend graduations. He would attend exhibitions. He would attend orientations. I don't know the, the level of contact and relationship that Frederick Douglass had with the student body of the University of Rochester, but there are individual students that graduate, that attended and or graduated from the University of Rochester that later in life had uh, friendship and correspondence with Frederick Douglass, and there's evidence that this that the, the develop Frederick Douglass developing a relationship with some of these individuals started at the University of Rochester. Uh, maybe Frederick Douglass was, you know, a guest speaker of the equivalent of the Black Student Union at the time. Although I don't believe they had a Black Student Union, but Frederick Douglass, I believe, somehow, some way, uh, was known to the students. As an example, there's an anecdote of a student that in the library, in the reading room, when Frederick Douglass's North Star newspaper and or by then it might have been known as Frederick Douglass's Weekly or Frederick Douglass's Monthly, essentially when Frederick Douglass's newspaper arrived on campus, that many of the students essentially would elbow each other, kind of, you know, tussle a little bit because they all wanted to basically read it first. And I think that's also a very interesting insight is that not only was the university president on friendly terms with Frederick Douglass, but that the university 
subscribed to his publications and made them accessible to students, which is interesting in the context, in the modern context of 2023, when uh, I guess the banning of books or, you know, sanitizing certain curriculums or, you know, censorship in higher education or censorship in education is a contemporary topic that President Anderson and the University of Rochester uh, were, were open, you know, intellectually to embracing, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass and discussing, you know, ideas of freedom, you know, liberty, you know, this is before the Civil War, so abolition. Um, so I think that is something that also really cannot be understated. All right. So the University of Rochester had radical faculty. Professor John H. Raymond, he was the second president of Vassar College, which uh, I believe it's into, I believe it's co-ed today, but for many, many years, Vassar College was a premier um, uh, women's college. And I believe it's in Massachusetts. So President Raymond, before he was president of Vassar College, was faculty at the University of Rochester. I don't believe anybody in the city of Rochester knows this. Nobody, I don't even know if the Historical Society still exists, unfortunately. It's been a very sad to read the stories of the deterioration of the Rochester Historical Society. And the Mr. Bill Keeler, who's a fine gentleman. But I, and I don't know if the University of Rochester knows this, but Frederick Douglass worked alongside Professor Raymond on the Underground Railroad in Rochester. While Professor Raymond was a faculty at the University of Rochester, he worked alongside Frederick Douglass moving, transporting individuals who had arrived in Rochester from the southern United States and were trying to make it to St. Catharines, Canada uh, and make it beyond the reach of the United States Department of Justice. While this gentleman is a faculty at the University of Rochester, he's working alongside Frederick Douglass on the Underground Railroad. The significance and importance of that cannot be understated. And I really hope that after this presentation is published, I don't see someone from the university or some paper essentially um, stealing this research. Because I've made myself available to speak at these institutions on several occasions. So Douglas's connections to the University of Rochester were extremely significant that he's working with professors um, on the Underground Railroad. To the right is a congressman, Charles G. Williams from Wisconsin. He was a student at the University of Rochester. Uh, he was involved in a student organization that invited uh, Frederick Douglass to give a lecture that the proceeds of the lecture would then benefit the student organization. I do not know if Mr. Williams was initially one of the gentlemen who approached Mr. Douglas to make that uh, invite, but Frederick Douglass and Mr. Williams had a relationship for several decades, as I just shared on the previous presentation. Mr. Williams, he, although he was from Wisconsin, he attended the University of Rochester, which you know, University of Rochester is a, is a well-respected institution of higher learning. Uh, locally in Western New York, you know, in the state of New York, on the East Coast, as well as nationally, you know, the R University of Rochester is um, is a you know is an older institution of higher learning, is very well known, so that students from all throughout the country would 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 seek uh, their education there. So, Mr. Williams, after graduating from the University of Rochester, served in the United States House of Representatives, and in an interesting way, he makes a comment on the house floor where he speaks to his kind of friendship that he had with uh, Mr. Douglas. All right. And one of the interesting visual reminders uh, or physical manifestations of uh, the closeness of Frederick Douglass and the university of Rochester is in 1878, I believe um President Anderson may have commissioned this and or approved the commission, but in 1878, there was a commission by the University of Rochester to uh, have a bust made or kind of, as you can see, they're kind of a, um, 
a sculpture, kind of a chest face sculpture of Mr. Frederick Douglass made. And it was made in 1878 and it was unveiled at Sibley Hall at the University of Rochester. President Anderson was in attendance. I do not believe Douglas was able to uh, attend the ceremony. I believe a letter of thanks and a letter of thanks by Mr. Douglas was read at the ribbon cutting. But I must emphasize this, whereas the University of Rochester and President Anderson were proud of their connection and friendship to Mr. Douglas to the extent that they wanted others to know by putting an actual representation of Mr. Douglas on the campus of the University of Rochester during his lifetime. And so this maybe uh, would work to remind students of the importance of Mr. Douglas, uh, you know, to the country, to the abolitionist movement, also maybe just the virtues and morals and principles that Mr. Douglas kind of embraced, that those were the same morals and principles uh, and ethics that uh, the University of Rochester wanted to instill uh, to its students. Now, this is also a topic of continuing research um, that it could take several more years, several more decades to really understand the extent of Douglas's connections to the University of Rochester and President Anderson. I, there are some sources that say William Page, who was from Brockport, New York, was a student uh, at the University of Rochester in the 1870s and 1880s. I just not have... I have not found evidence of that. I believe there, the first black student at the University of Rochester was in the 1880s. I do not know if they graduated. Um, but I would say that it's it's pretty interesting that Martin Brewer Anderson was, was very public in acknowledging his connections and relationships with Frederick Douglass. Um, and I think that uh, that is important to note. And as I mentioned earlier, Douglass was involved with Storer College in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, which had connections to the Free Will Baptist, which was kind of part of the um, Baptist Mission Home Society, which was part of like the American Missionary Association. There were essentially these philanthropic organizations that would help fund education. For example, the Peabody Fund would help fund uh, HBCUs uh, in the Southern United States. And Frederick Douglass helped to to advocate within his networks for uh, some of these institutions. And so there is a distinction where Frederick Douglass was closely connected to several HBCUs, including Ta uh, Tuskegee, Fisk, Howard, Storer College. Um, but he also was connected to more, um, I guess the term is PWIs, so kind of more the uh, traditional old guard institutions. Frederick Douglass's grandson graduated from Harvard University. Frederick Douglass knew many of graduates of Harvard, including Wendell Phillips, Charles Sumner, et cetera, et cetera. And Frederick Douglass was friends with many university presidents. And so I think that to discuss Frederick Douglass in higher education, I think that the University of Rochester uh, is very pivotal to that understanding. And I think that the the generosity and kindness that Professor Anderson showed Frederick Douglass while he was in Rochester, essentially saying that, you know, Frederick Douglass is a representation of Rochester, the University of Rochester is a representation of the city, and that that um very interesting to find that these two historic the one historical institution and the historical figure of Frederick Douglass has these interwoven connections. And I think that it really is our responsibility to educate and uplift this history. And if we don't, it will be lost and ignored. And that is to the great detriment of young students in Rochester and students at the university today to not bring a greater recognition and acknowledgement of this, uh, this history. And so just wanted to thank the organizers for Douglas Week for kind of continuing to uh, bring an awareness and recognition to Mr. Douglas and all the various fields uh, of study that he touches and wanted to thank all of those who have tuned in to Douglas Week. Uh, this week, there's some more wonderful programming happening and we encourage you to check uh, the programming out online, check us out on YouTube and thank you for tuning in to Douglas Week 2023.